We are so glad that you have chosen to join uh, Ecclesia in worship today. Um, we have some folks that have been not been with us in a while. We welcome you back. Um, this is Valaya's first time in worship, and we are so glad to have her with us today. So, Valaya, your aunts come all the time, and we're just so glad that you can be with us today, too. I, I understand. Oh, really? Well, we are so glad that you're here to share with us. That's amazing. All right, so we are going to talk about that in a little bit, Valaya. Thank you so much for sharing. We are happy to be, uh, we want to know all about your life. So thank you. Um, as we begin in worship, we speak into our presence those who are not with us, uh, beginning with our beloveds in Lava Ita, Lava Ita Cuba at Rivers of Living Water Church. Just feel them join us through the conduit of the Holy Spirit right now. They are worshiping right now. And as they worship and speak us into their presence, we feel their presence here with us. What a blessing it is to worship around the globe, even while we are right here in this place. Uh, there are others who are not with us today. Um, we have some Dotsons who are uh, at the orchard. But we have a very strong Dotson component this morning. Um, oh, any, anyway, so, uh, yeah. but we miss Chris and Craig um, as they're down at the, the orchard working. Who else? Adam and Gabrielle. And Adam and Gabrielle. Yes. Jeff. Jeff, absolutely. Online, we have Robin and Kim and Dawn. We're so glad that you guys are with us. Thank you for joining. The rest of the Tachinkos. The rest of the Tachinkos. Yes, this was anniversary weekend for them. And I think the kids were away with their grandparents this weekend. So um, anyway. Well, I'm, I'm, I think about Emma. Yes, Hi. Emma. Hi. We miss Emma. Emma's doing good. I'm so glad. Well, you tell her that everybody at Ecclesia, Ecclesia misses her. We spoke her right into our presence. We can already feel her here. All right, let us worship God together, singing our first hymn, which is Amazing Grace. Ah, that's amazing. If you need to look <laughs> up lyrics, it's on page five in the hymn book. And uh, our good friend Mahan Siler had something to say to Kim this week that I thought was really great that any moment is a moment that we can step into wonder. That we can just sort of at any time, at any given time of any day, we can step into the wonder, that amazing wonder of the grace of God is available at all times. So let's sing that grace, about that grace that has brought us here today. Amazing grace, how sweet that saved a wretch like me.
psalm I'll be reading this morning is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the words of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear Him. He remembers His covenant forever. He has shown His people the power of His works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. These are the steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for His people. He ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. This is the word of the Lord. At Ecclesia, we love to have children in our midst. And our view at Ecclesia is that the sound of children presence is, sounds a lot like the Holy Spirit. And so when you hear any background noises and you, you hear that that is a child, then that is just a reminder to thank God for the gift of children and what a joy it is uh, to hear children learning how to be in worship. Because you see, you can't learn if you don't come if, and you don't have a chance to learn. And so to God be the glory for holy disruption. Amen? 
As you know, I often make this mistake of looking at the news. <laughs> and um, boy, oh boy, uh, there, have, there, there were some horrifying things that I saw today, particularly the local news, stay off the local news, that's the worst. It doesn't matter which local, <laughs> it just doesn't matter. Um, but there's also good news. And um, so I wanna share some of that first. Beginning with the town of Babcock Ranch. Babcock Ranch is located 20 miles outside of Fort Myers, Florida, the heart of the devastation from the Hurricane Ian last week. Babcock Ranch was designed to be a shelter and a uh, stronghold in, in difficulty. By that I mean they have solar power, native flora, built to code construction, and um, the, the only destruction they had from the, the devastation of the hurricane was ripped up pool coverings and a few broken fence posts, posts and, and shingles because they had designed the entire town to withstand hurricanes um, and storms. So they didn't really know for sure if it would work until now, um, but it did. And so now um, their, their town is expecting a burst in But they are also a model for us to learn from and how to uh, sustain communities beyond um, hurricanes. So that's good news. They are doing great and setting us an example for the rest of us. Good news. Other good news in the um, technical realm is from a biotech company by the name of Biogen. Biogen announced this week that in their third um, phase, phase three clinical trials of a new drug to fight Alzheimer's disease, they have shown that their drug slowed the rate of cognitive, cognitive decline for early onset patients by 27%. This is um, the most encouraging result in the history of Alzheimer's research. And so they are very excited that this will soon be approved and available to people suffering from Alzheimer's. And that will give their families and them um, a chance to make new memories. That's great news, isn't it? Also is, is the news that Cashton York, who is an eight-year-old, um, wait, no, yep, Cashton York is an eight-year-old who was enjoying his school lunch of chicken nuggets in a public school in Oklahoma when he began to, to choke and he was holding his throat and there wasn't a teacher close enough, as close as named Garrett Brown, who jumped into action and performed the Heimlich maneuver and saved Cashton's life. Um, when asked why he did it, he said, well, that's just how my daddy taught me. When somebody's choking, he taught me how to do the Heimlich maneuver. That's good news, right? I thought so too. Our community um, of Ecclesia is dealing with a lot of grief. Um, Karen uh, is, is still coping with the loss of Dave. Kim lost um, her mother last week, and we continue to grieve with you. Um, as I mentioned before uh, church, my uncle passed away yesterday. Dana's father is in um, hospice care, headed to hospice care, um, and there's certainly a lot of grief associated with that. These things are heavy. What a joy it is, though, to have a community to help us lift those burdens. And so as we go to God in prayer now, join your hearts with each other that we can hold these burdens together in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this time that we have together. This time when we can turn from all of the multiple distractions of the world and look to you. 
we confess that we forget to do that. We confess that we forget to include you in our plans. We forget and turn first to the media or social media for comfort instead of turning to you. Thank you, God, for always being there with an outstretched hand, waiting for us to turn back to you. Oh God, we pray for those whose hearts are heavy with bereavement this day, whether from loss, illness, anxiety, job insecurity. Lord, we ask that you would let your peace settle into this place, reminding us again that you are always in control and that your love never fails. We push back because we feel so often that we have been failed, that, that despair is taking over. Oh God, help us to pull in the love that you have shared with us, to wrap that love around our hearts and to share that love with others in this community and beyond as we remind ourselves and each other of Jesus. Lord, there are names that weigh heavy on our hearts this morning. And so as an act of worship and praise, we lift those names up to you and ask, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sandra Dr. Jermaine Weaver. I'm thankful for our pastor Eileen and Jay and all the church for all the prayers and love that we've received. Gail and Lisa. Nell Mitchell. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for our second hymn. Please stand as we sing our second hymn. 26. Number 26. I 
troubles to bless and sanctify to be thy deepest bitter stress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only desire thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I shall not, I will not desert to their foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to reach, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. These old hymns are some of my favorites, and I absolutely love singing them. And I want to make sure that uh, those who didn't grow up in church, maybe, uh, know what some of those words mean. Um, when it says, uh, the dross to consume and the gold to refine. Dross was... Uh, uh, Impure parts. I was thinking the word garbage, and I didn't think that totally got it. So the impure parts. And um, I love the phrase, um, your soul will repose um, into God. Repose means relax, recline. Sort of like Litzy and Valaya are here. And so I guess what that means is... It's time for the children's story. Yay! I tell you what, um, maybe we should move the camera so that, um, but I'll have to, where can we move so that you can see us the best? I'll sit right here. Um, and so, um, Coy, you'll need to move so you can see the pictures. All right. Well, yeah, I, see, I, I know you want to get up and come on. Come on. You can sit down here, too. Valaya, would you please come pull the book out of the bag for me, please? You reach in there and pull that book out? No, just open the bag like this and pull the book out. That's it? Yep. Can you pull it out? Pull the book out. Like this, just the book. There. Can you hand me that? That's it. Can you show everybody? Can you show everybody what the book is? Excellent. Now, can you give it back to me so I can read it? Thank you. The book is called What Do You Do With a Chance? And it's written by Kobe Yoda. That means Kobe drew the pictures. And it's, no, that doesn't mean that. It means wrote the words. It's illustrated by May Beeson. And so she drew the pictures. What do you do with a chance? I got a chance. It just seemed to show up. It acted like it knew me. It wanted something. I didn't know why it was there. What do you do with a chance? I wondered. It fluttered around me, it brushed up against me, it circled me as if it wanted me to grab it. I started to reach for it, but I was unsure and pulled back, and so it flew away. I thought about it a lot. I wish I'd taken my chance. I realized I had wanted it, but I still didn't know if I had the courage. When another chance came around, I wasn't so sure, but I decided to try. 
I wanted to reach for it, but I missed and fell, and I was so embarrassed. And it seemed like everybody was looking at me, and I decided I never wanted to feel this way ever again. So after that, whenever a chance came along, I just ignored it. And the more I ignored them, the less they came around. Until one day I noticed that I hadn't seen a chance in quite a while. It was as if they all disappeared. I started to worry, what if I don't get another chance? I know I acted like I didn't care, but the truth was I did. I still wanted to take a chance, but I was afraid and I wasn't sure if I would ever be brave enough. Then I thought, wait, maybe I don't have to be brave all the time. Maybe I just need to be brave for a little while at the right time. I realized it was up to me. I promised myself that if I ever got another chance, I wasn't going to hold back. If I got another chance, I was going to be ready. Now, I don't know how well y'all can see these pictures, but this is a picture of a very ready little person. He's got his bear and everything. Then one seemingly ordinary day, I saw something shining far off in the distance. Is it possible, I hoped, could this be my chance? I had to find out. I ran as hard and as fast as I could toward it. I don't know how to explain it, but the second I let go of my fears, I was full of excitement. And this is one full of excitement little fella. It wasn't that I was no longer afraid, it wasn't that. But now my excitement was bigger than my fear. I got closer and as I got closer, I could see this was a really huge chance. But this time I was ready. As it came by, I reached out and grabbed it. I held on with all my might. It felt so good to soar, to fly, to be free. I now see that when I hold back, I miss out and I don't want to miss out. There's just so much I want to see and do and discover. So what do you do with a chance? You take it because it just might be the start of something incredible. The end. You know, every day we have to make choices. Every day we have chances to do the right thing or the not so right thing. We have choices whether or not to help build God's kingdom and make it look here on earth, just like it does in heaven. We get that choice every day. We get a chance. And what we need to do every single time is take a chance to love people like Jesus does. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the chances that you give us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And our second story this morning comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. If you have your Bibles, uh, 2 Timothy is in the New Testament, what Christians call the New Testament. And that means it's towards the end of the Bible. Um, and so scroll down um, and tap on 2 Timothy or um, <laughs> uh, turn to uh, 2 Timothy in your Bible. We'll be um, beginning with, chap with verse 8, reading through verse 15. Hear the word of God. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descendant of David, 
That is my gospel for which I suffer a hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If, he, if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words which does no good, but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. This is the word of truth, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When he was 16 years old, Brian Banks had the world by its tail. He was among the most watched juniors in high school being scouted by professional and also college football teams. Brian Banks was not just good at football, he was extraordinary. His talent was such that as a junior, he had already committed to the University of Southern California. He was going places. His dream was to play professional football. But that dream died when a student at his high school accused him of a violent crime that he did not commit. His lawyer advised him to plea bargain and that he would get out with just a few months of probation, but it didn't work that way. He, plead, he pled guilty, he took the plea, and then he was sentenced to six years in prison and six years of probation. Just like that, his dream turned to dust and he was furious. The system had done him wrong. They didn't even look at the evidence. They never even went to the scene of the crime. They took the young woman's word against his, tried him as an adult, and labeled him for life. His dreams were chalk. So he, he went to prison, and being there in prison, he got madder and madder and madder. His mother had had to sell her home and her car to hire the lawyer that let them down. He had let his mother down, and he felt like the world. So he got mad, and then he got madder. And before long, he was bitter. So he was put into this class that he didn't really want to take, but he took it because they said he had to. And it was there that he met a mentor who changed his life because he told Brian Banks, until you get free in here, you will never be free in here. Now, pause. Everybody just leave that story right there. We have a problem with mass incarceration in this country. That is not what we're talking about today. That is another issue. This is a singular individual that we're talking about not talking about um, all of the injustices that are done in prison. But for this young man, in this particular context, what he needed to hear was free your mind. Stop thinking about what has been done to you and begin to think about what you can do with what has been done to you. And so Brian Banks got a little flicker of hope. And it was that flicker of hope that carried him through until his early release in um, five years and a month after the fact of his um, imprisonment. Of course, by that time, all of his classmates had not only 
gone to college, but had finished college. He came out, he was an old man compared to the other football players on the college field. But he got, he got on with a college, a local community college, and while he was on parole, began to play football, and things were looking great. And then the government passed a law that he had to wear an uh, alarm um, anklet, and he couldn't wear it and play football because it would destroy it. And so once again, he's knocked down, and over and over again, he can't get a job. But there's this flicker. <coughs> This little bit of hope that remains. His mother had never lost her faith. She continued to lift Brian up and Brian continued to lean into that faith. He continued to proclaim his innocence. And on <coughs> May 24th, 2012, the court overturned his conviction. And he walked out of the courtroom, cut off the, the anklet, and walked out with no record at all. <coughs> Brian Banks never forgot that the truth of his innocence was what would free him. Even when he was in prison, he felt more free when he could hang on to the truth. That <clears throat> unbounded truth is what Paul references in today's text. We call 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus, the pastorals. These three short little books were written by Paul to young pastors, Timothy and Titus. Paul wrote Titus first, and then he wrote 1 and 2 Timothy. In our Bible, Titus comes later, <coughs> comes after 1 and 2 Timothy. But it was actually written first. And so in Titus and in 1 Timothy, Paul is, um, has a great attitude, he's healthy, he's strong. And he's encouraging these young preachers from a place of confidence and hope. But in 2 Timothy, he's in prison. <coughs> we'll get. <coughs> and so he writes 2 Timothy towards the end of his life when he's feeling desperate, when he's feeling a sense of urgency in life. <coughs> okay, so if anybody has a cough drop, that would be great. Um, it'll get better momentarily. Last week, we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Today, we're in chapter 2, but let's first look at the end of chapter 1. <coughs> the end of chapter 1, um, Paul tells Timothy about some mutual friends who, who have had different experiences. Two, one has remained faithful, but two have strayed along with others from Asia Minor. And so he says to Timothy, this is what is happening with these people. They've had different responses. And then he begins chapter two. You then, my child, my sweet baby, remember for last week, you, my sweet baby, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> I don't know what it is about preaching that, that <laughs> everybody's, everybody's just scurrying about here to uh, see if we can get a grip. Um, so it starts with you then, my child, you then, my sweet baby, be strong. Don't be like those who have strayed. Be like the ones who have been steadfast. Be like the ones who have held firm. Thank you. Um, to the teaching. He goes on to say, um, 
do this so that you'll be able to teach others well. That's why you want to stay strong, so that you can teach others. He then says, um, be like a soldier, Paul says in chapter two. Be like a soldier, be obedient and focused. Be like an athlete, be honest and hardworking. Be like a farmer, be dedicated and patient. Paul says this kingdom building is tough work. You're gonna need to put some skin in the game. It's not gonna be easy. And then we come to today's text, um, beginning in chapter eight, when Paul implores the hearers to remember Jesus. And he tells us two things about who Jesus is. The first is that Jesus has been raised. The second is that Jesus is a descendant of David. Now this is foundational to Paul because when Paul was a little boy growing up and learning about who God is, he learned about David. Now David, boy, he was something else. He was a scoundrel and a cheat and a liar. <laughs> he, he was all of these horrible things and he had the heart of God. <coughs> David was one who was profoundly broken. His mistakes were legion. And yet, David's brokenness was nothing beside God's love and grace. David's brokenness combined with God's grace meant David could be used by God. And so this is very important to Paul that people know that Jesus is a descendant of that broken, messed up, redeemed king. <clears throat> Not only that, Jesus has been raised. He says that first, because when it comes to brokenness and being redeemed, there isn't much that, that tops brokenness, death, being redeemed, being raised. And so Paul says this, remember Jesus, he's a descendant of David. He's descended, descended from a broken human who God used in miraculous ways. And Jesus defeated death, he was raised. <coughs> and I just think that he says this because he knows, he knows that everybody listening is thinking about their own brokenness, thinking about how, look, this whole new religion business, starting this community together, man, we are a mess. We're all broken. Some of us are, are liars and cheats and some of us are lazy and some of, <laughs> we have all kind of mess going on. And Paul says, yeah, well, you ain't got nothing on David. So, and God sent God's son through David's line. <coughs> and so he reminds them of that. And then he says, um, he sings a little hymn or he writes the verses to a, a hymn. And he says this, um, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. That, those little verses, that's um, apparently according to theologians and scholars, that is a piece of a hymn. And so when he's writing his letter, he thinks of this song and he includes the lyrics in the letter. And I love to think about Timothy reading this letter and getting to this part and singing it. Because you kind of, you, you can't not sing lyrics. Let, let's, if I say right now, I see Trees of green. What are you doing? Yeah. Red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. And then you go on and read the rest of it, right? But you're going to sing the lyrics because you can't not sing lyrics. And so I love to think of Timothy getting this letter and going, oh, yeah, I remember. Sings the lyrics. 
And then um, we get this hymn and we sing along for a minute, but then we stumble. We sing along just fine. If we have died with him, we also live with him. Oh yeah, that sounds good. That's a fair trade, tit for tat. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Well, sure, that sounds good. We endure, we reign, sweet. <coughs> and then it says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. And we say, wait, what? Well, hold, hold, hold on. I don't want to sing that song. I don't like that stanza. And I think a lot of people who read this will just skip that stanza because they don't, that's not a nice stanza. We're going to skip that one. But, you know, I encourage you to do your own research, as they say, look into it. But in the um, commentaries that I read, I, I, came down to three different things about this particular text. First of all, <clears throat> just like the story of Brian Banks is the story of Brian Banks and not of every prisoner and every conviction, this letter was written to a particular group of people at a particular time in a particular context. This letter and all the pastorals, all three pastorals were written for a specific reason. And so um, Paul has this urgent message to deliver and he doesn't want people to mess around and fail to build God's kingdom. Paul's days are numbered, he feels like. He wants people to get busy. And so he finds these lyrics that are appropriate to his message that he's trying to send to Timothy. And, he, and in that song is the line if you want to deny Christ, go ahead. God will deny you and, and then we'll move on. we got a kingdom to build here. We don't have time for this. So if you want to deny God, okay, do that. We've got a kingdom to build. We can't write around. So there's that, the context and the urgency that Paul felt. Second, for the original hearers and for us, it is a reminder that God is not going to force faith on us. You, you don't have to believe in God. You really don't. Um, it's okay. You can make that choice. If you want to deny God, that is completely your choice. And God will go along with that. We hadn't gotten to the next verse yet. So hold on. Good news is coming. And then finally, I think this might be a little softer than the way we read it in English. I um, looked at the Greek, it didn't really give us any tips here. And every English translation I looked at, I think I looked at eight, they all said the same thing here. Um, if, we deny, if, if we deny God, God will deny us. But I still think this is a time when we have to look at the full corpus of Paul's writing and see what does Paul say about Christ or God denying us. And over and over again, Paul says, God's love will never fail you. Over and over again, Paul says you, that nothing can separate us from God's love. In Romans 8, 38, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says love is above all and in all. Paul says over and over again that love never fails. And if love never fails, then there's something more that's being said here than we can really understand. So I invite you with this verse to open your mind to the idea that maybe there's more to it than we can see. Maybe there's more to it that we can understand. And if you can do that, then you can move on and read the next verse. And that is, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he can't deny himself. Paul's consistent message is not that God will deny you if you deny God. Paul's consistent message is a message of love and grace and second chances. And so Paul puts this verse in there because for this particular context, it works. 
And there you go. He comes right back to the message. He says over and over again, God never fails. God is always faithful. Paul is encouraging this younger pastor, this younger pastor who's struggling to grow into himself and lead a congregation. And so he says, I know there's a lot of things that are binding you. <coughs> there's family conflict. There's dissension in the church. There's all kinds of things that have you bound and have your community bound. There's illness and death and grief and brokenness and, and sickness and mental illness. There's all of these things happening. But the word of God is freedom. Remember Jesus? Paul says, and he says to Timothy, remind them of this and warn them before the Lord that they are to avoid wrangling over words like deny him, um, which does no good. Don't, don't split the hairs, we've all done it. How many of us in church have said, when the pigs are sent over, those of us who grew up in church will understand the reference. There's a story in scripture where God sends the demons into the pigs. And I have never taught that text that somebody didn't say, but I feel sorry for the pigs. I know, I do too. I do too, but that's not the point. That's not the point of the story. Um, we, we listen to Noah's Ark and we say, oh, but I feel so sorry for the animals. I do too. I also feel sorry for the people. People never say that. They just say they feel sorry for the animals. That's not the point of the story. So don't wrangle over words. Listen for the truth because the truth is unbound and the truth will set you free. And the truth is Jesus. Let us pray. Loving God for fresh mints and cold water, we give you thanks for community that holds us in the light of truth. We praise you. We ask your blessing upon this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. He who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You've heard the word of God preached, presented, and sung, and read, and now you are called to respond in whatever way God is calling you to respond as we sing our final hymn. Number 68. Number 68. Mm. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and Turn your eyes upon you. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace O oh, death into life everlasting He passed and we follow him there for us sin hath no dominion, for more than conquerors we know. Turn your
your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dear In the eyes of his glory and grace His word shall not fail as he promised Believe him and all will then go to a world that is dying This perfect salvation to do Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow light of his glory and And when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, Jesus is going to look back in your face and say, you are loved and there is nothing you can do about it. Thanks for worshiping with Ecclesia today. We're so glad that you've been here. We'll see you next week. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.